Mr. Chairman and my dear brothers and sisters, you can sense the difficulty that is ahead of me. In 75 minutes, Dr. Shirosh was able to draw before us 150 red herrings. Catch them. At the speed you realize, I'm an old man of 70, and reading at the speed of 100 miles an hour. <laughs> makes it very, very difficult. You appreciate it, makes it very difficult for anybody. <laughs> so now, you know, towards the end, he made some charge about the Prophet of Islam that he didn't know the difference between Maryam, the mother of Jesus, and Miriam, the sister of Harun and Musa. Therefore, <laughs> therefore, Dr. Shorosh concluded that the Quran is not the word of God. That's his, his reason, his logic. Now, when the Muslim explains that this is a respectful way of talking, as the Quran says, reading those verses from the beginning, This is Surah. 19, Surah Maryam, say, at length she brought the babe to her people, carrying him in her arms. Qadu, they said, Ya Maryam, laqad jikti shayyan fariya. Say, oh Mary, truly an amazing thing has now brought. Alleging, insinuating, that how is it that you brought this child into the world without a husband? Insinuating that the child is illegitimate. What is she to do? Can she tell them, he says, you know, I heard voices and I carried a baby for nine months and now I delivered it and I brought it here. Were they in the mood to listen to her? No. So they say, Ya Uqta Haruna, O sister of Harun, Ma kana abu kimra asawim, wa ma kana ummu kibagiya. Say, your father was not a man of evil, nor thy mother a woman and changed. You coming from such a noble family of the priests of the Bani Israel because Musa salam, and Harun salam, were the Imams of the Bani Israel. Imamat leadership was a family tradition among the Jews. And as such, you coming from a, a noble ancestry of being in the family of Harun, Ukhta Harun, and your father was a good man, your mother was a virtuous woman. How is it that you brought this child without a husband? What is she to do? She points to the babe, ask him, because she knew that this is no ordinary child. For Asharat Ilay, but she pointed to the babe, and the babe, by a miracle, Jesus spoke from his mother's arms. But the charge still remains that the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad, didn't know the difference between this Maryam, the mother of Jesus, and that Maryam, mother of, uh, uh, sister of Musa and Harun. The difference is, as the doctor said, 1,300 and some odd years difference.
to the most reasonable explanation given by the Muslim, the Christian nods his head. He says, no, Muhammad didn't know the difference. All right? All right? Muhammad didn't know the difference. So this can't be the word of God. So let us see now. I said, you see, the answer to your problem is in your own book. The Bible is in your Holy Bible. Where is it? It is in the first book of the New Testament. First book, chapter 1, verse 1. You will never forget. One, one, one. Three aces in a game. You will never forget. What does it say? You ask me what does it say? I tell you what it says. It says, you remember I showed you the genealogy? Yes. The first verse. It says, this is the genealogy of Jesus Christ. The son of Abraham, the son of David. Ask him. Ask him. Is that what it says? Jesus is the son of Abraham, he is the son of David. Then in the Gospel of St. Luke, in the other genealogy, he is the son of Joseph. Joseph the carpenter is his father. Then in the book of Mark, he is the son of God. Wait, 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 wait. He is the son of Abraham, means Abraham is his father. He is the son of David, David is his father. He is the son of Joseph, Joseph is his father. He is the son of God, God is his father. A man who's got four fathers, in your language, sir, in America, what do you call it? He can respond. He said, no, 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 he doesn't mean that. So what does it mean? So he starts explaining. I said, you see, it's the same. You are, you know, look, Jesus told you, he warned you. He said, judge not that he be not judged. For with what judgment he judge, he shall be judged. He said, you hypocrite, why seest thou the mote in thy brother's eyes and seest not the beam in thy own eye? So first remove the beam from your own eye. <laughs> you see, he, our brother has been quoting so many words, 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 words. Arabic, 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 Arabic. But his knowledge of Arabic, you get the tape, and you'll find that he has been speaking falsehood to the people more than twice. I give you the examples. At the first meeting in the Royal Albert Hall, Dr. Sharosh comes forward at question time and he was fortunately being videotaped. He comes there and he tells, he's asking, he says, Mr. D. Dad, you Muslims, you believe that Jesus Christ, you see, is, is alive. I said, yes. But he said, what have you to say about the Qur'an? The Qur'an says, in his meticulous Arabic, It says, Which means, and he mistranslated. If you remember, get the tape and you see, he mistranslated, for which he has not apologized yet. He mistranslated, he said, Therefore Jesus was born, he died and he rose again. He said, so peace is on me, the day that I was born, the day that I died, and the day that I shall be raised to life again. He mistranslated, as an Arab, it was inexcusable. Knowing Arabic, he mistranslated the word, as died, when it is in the future tense, the day that I die, not died. He mistranslated. <laughs> if, if, if that was deliberate, it's devilish. If it is in ignorance, inexcusable. Then again, at the second debate, he goes on to tell his audience in the Royal Albert Hall that the Trinity is in the Quran 113 times. And he quotes. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We see the Trinity 113 times in the Quran, like the Bible says, Bismil Ab Wal Ibn Wa Ruhul Qudus. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Trinity, he says that's the Trinity. As an Arab, inexcusable, if he's deliberately doing it, is devilish. 
Look, his knowledge of Arabic, poor, very poor. <laughs> no, it's the same sickness is coming again and again. Where? Which one? 15 minutes, which one you're going to catch? Now, he lied in the previous meeting. He said, and I quoted, if you remember, while I was quoting, I said, you quoted, this is what you said. This is, let me challenge you. 75% of the wonderful Quran in my wonderful language of Arabic is from the Bible. This is, let me challenge you. Me or the audience or all. Let me challenge you. 75% of the wonderful Quran in my wonderful Arabic is from the Bible. You remember that? And he said, he said, he can show it to you now. I said, no, have your patience. He had 75 minutes. He didn't show one example. One example. Seventy-five percent of this book is copied in that, and he could not show as one example. You see, you, you know what is to copy, what is to crib, what is to plagiarize, stealing somebody else's literature. Look, the Christians and the Jews have been at it. They have been at it. They have written books. Here, yeah. Judaism in the Quran by Abraham Katz few hundred pages. Then the sources of Islam, the sources of the Quran by Reverend Saint Claire Tinsdale. Books, books. They have written more than 60,000 books against Islam from 1800 to 1950. More than 60,000 books they have been written so far. See, they behave like innocent little children, little babes, like cherubims, but not cherubims. They have written more than 60,000. Among them, here, yeah, Judaism in the Quran, here, yeah, the sources of Islam, sources of the Quran. Reverend Saint Claire Tinsda, Reverend and Saint, he wrote the book. <laughs> and he is giving verses, verses, verses. That one they are giving verses, verses, verses. But this was originally written in Farsi, Persian, in the Persian language. So, Reverend, Sir William Moyer, he translates this into English and he writes a preface. He writes a preface to his translation and he says, It is strange, it is strange, it's odd, it's unusual, it's extraordinary. He says, It is strange. That though the Jewish and Christian scriptures are spoken of throughout the Quran with the utmost devotion. The Quran speaks about the Jewish and Christian scriptures, the Torah, the Zabur, the Injil, with utmost devotion. Only one passage, only one passage is quoted from them. That's all. Only one. Though the Quran is speaking about it, 75% is copied. Says Dr. Shirosh, 73 quarter is copied from the Bible. Yet this great man, Sir William Moore, a scholar, he says only one passage is quoted from them. Namely, and he quotes. Namely, and he quotes. The meek shall inherit the earth. One quotation. Now, look for it. There isn't such a verse in the Quran. The nearest is Walakat Sarrafna Walakat Katapna Fit Daburi Mimba the Thikri and Al Arda Yari Suhay Badi Salihun says that we had given to Dawood in the Sabur this message that to my righteous servant, my righteous servants will inherit the earth. That is what the Quran says. But this quotation, the mix shall inherit the earth, you find that in Matthew chapter 5, verse 5, where Jesus says, the meek shall inherit the earth. Now you see that in the Bible that our doctor has given me, there are cross-references and it tells you that this quotation is from Psalms chapter 37, verse 11. 
That quotation is from Psalms. Jesus says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. But when you look for it, you find it in Psalms chapter 37, verse 11. Word for word. But Jesus didn't give the credit to David. He said, look, I got this from the Psalms. Muhammad is made to say that this is written, he's actually quoting, this is written, he's giving due credit in the Zabur, it is there. And you find that this is what the Quran says. Jesus Christ is actually plagiarizing. If he didn't mention it, if he didn't give credit, he is plagiarizing. He is stealing from somebody else's writing, not Muhammad. So, still, still, you see, look, what is to copy? What is to crib? You must show to us, I have the Arabic Bible here, in case he hasn't got it, and got the Arabic Quran here. What he must show here, that in the Arabic Bible, Jesus says, I am a father of one. It's a look in the Quran, Muhammad says, I am a father of one. In the Bible, Jesus says, that he that has seen me has seen the father. And you see, Muhammad also says, for example, that he that has seen me has seen the father. This is what is called copy. This is what is called cribbing. This is what is called plagiarism. So far, in the 75 long minutes, unbearably long minutes, he has not yet given us a single phrase of word copy that Muhammad has copied from his 75 percent in the Bible. The Arabic Bible is here, sir, make easy for you, and the Arabic Quran is also here, make it easy for you. Thank you, Mr. Dida. There appears to have been a little confusion. Dr. Anis Sharosh was of the opinion that he would be accorded additional time for his rebuttal. Uh, he appears to have been laboring under the mistaken belief that the time allocated and in fact utilized by him initially, the 90 minutes, did not include the 15 minutes for the rebuttal. In view of this, uh, both uh, the sides have agreed that he will be now allocated 15 minutes for his rebuttal. After which, please, ladies and gentlemen, please, let me complete. After which, Mr. Ahmad Didat will be given another 15 minutes to continue his rebuttal. Please bear in mind that this meeting has to be con conducted fairly, and that means you're participating in a fair manner as well. Please let both speakers express their views and opinions you could raise objections after they have spoken, not while they are speaking. Dr. Anis Sharosh for 15 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'm sorry to say that I understood I was coming for a rebuttal. I didn't realize I've taken the time. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. Verse 11. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I may not sin against you. Verse 133, direct my steps by your word and let no iniquity have dominion over me. Second Timothy 3, 16 to 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Romans 15, 4. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. There are no less than 300 prophecies that were fulfilled in the time and lifetime of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the Quran we are told and argue not with the people of the scripture unless it be in a way that is better. We are also told, and if thou, Muhammad, art in doubt concerning that which we reveal unto thee, then ask or inquire, if you please, those who read the scripture that was before thee. Then we read in Surah Al-Ma'idah, from Pictal, interestingly enough, it's verse 44. In Ali's, it's 47. And this is what it says. 
It was as who revealed the Lord to Moses, pardon me, it was we who revealed the Lord to Moses, therein was guidance and light, by its standard have been judged the Jews by the prophet who loved, who loved Allah, Allah's will, by the rabbis and the doctors of the law, for to them was entrusted the protection of Allah's book. It's called Allah's book. Now, Mr. Didat, as to the questions concerning these matters of figures and the lives of people, let me first mention to you that I'm amazed that a man of your caliber does not realize that in Matthew we have the lineage of Jesus from the side of Joseph, his adopted father. And you know, as well as I do, 66 fathers were not the real fathers. It was very simple. There was grave importance in those days and today placed on one's ability to prove his lineage because the inheritance depended on that. Therefore, Jesus was connected to the royal line of David from the tribe of Judah through Joseph. Dr. Luke followed another line from Mary because they were not brother and sister. And as you will know, King Hussein of Jordan traces his lineage to the Hashemites and therefore to that of Muhammad himself because of the importance involved. Accuracy, Mr. Dirac, must be the idea. As for the other matters that you mentioned, such as Samson. <laughs> First of all, ladies and gentlemen, no one has the right to make fun of the word of God because he is playing with fire. Secondly, I have noticed ever since I met Mr. Didat that he has a problem with the biblical miracles. Why? It appears to me that his Allah is too small for such demonstrations of the Almighty. Surely one can say Allahu Akbar all day and all night, but I would rather say Allahu Huwal Akbar. God is the greatest and therefore he is capable of providing his anointed servants with incredible powers to do his bidding. Listen to this. Mas'udi in Muradi volume 4 page 376 tells us that at the battle of Safin, Ali with his own hand, no weapon, no stick, no jawbone of an ass, had killed 525 men in one day. Now I wonder if this story is more believable than Samson killing 1,000 men with a large jawbone of a donkey. Samson even killed more people. Samson even killed more people without a weapon in his hand. If you know the Bible, he simply prayed, then pushed the pillars of the heathen's temple apart by his powerful arms, causing the roof to crumble over the thousands who were gathered there. He killed more without a weapon than with one. As to the foxes, Mr. Didat, apparently you haven't studied about foxes. Do you know that their favorite food is lamb and chicken? Could not Samson have placed the foxes' favorite food in a fenced area? so as to lure them into it, a common saying in most languages where foxes live states as sly as a fox. Why? Because, my dear friends, when captured, a fox plays dead till he is left alone. Then he takes off. Samson could have tied their tails while they were playing dead, then with a rope tied the torch between them, what a hilarious sight it must have been to see those creatures running throughout the fields with a flaming torch tied to their tails and setting fire to his enemy's corn. After all, Samson, my friends, was a practical joker, like I'm sure some of you, with a good sense of humor and very clever. Now, I'd like to ask you, please, the Quran states God inspired David to write the Zabur. Let me ask you a question. Do you know that there are 150 Psalms which God inspired? 50 are anonymous. We do not know who wrote them, humanly speaking. 12 by Asaph, 10 by the sons of Korah, 2 by Solomon, 1 by Moses, and the balance of the 150 by David. Therefore, the Quran is not correct. 
in claiming David wrote the Zabur. We also must ask you, what about the Injil? You say it was given to Jesus only. Galatians 3, 7 to 9 declares, Therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the nations by faith, preaching the gospel to Abraham beforehand. Did you get that? Saying, in you all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. God warns, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you. Hosea 4, 6. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for all Muslims is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a real zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven. That is to bring Christ down from heaven. Or who will descend into the abyss. That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. Even in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth that Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes to righteousness and with the mouth confession is made to salvation. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men teaching that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for God and for good works. Ladies and gentlemen, these are not my words. These are from Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, from Romans 10, 1 through 10 and 17, and from Titus 2, 11 to 14. How much time do I have? About three minutes. Yes. All right. Old Testament was concluded 1,000 years before the Quran. The New Testament was concluded by over 500 years before the Quran. Therefore, authenticity stands firmly with the Holy Bible, not the Quran, from a scientific and archaeological viewpoint. Therefore, whenever the Quran does not agree with the Holy Bible, one must conclude, scientifically speaking, that the Quran is inaccurate and wrong and not the Bible. I will urge you, I will urge you to study the Bible and know where the Quran came from instead of getting emotional. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, your attention, please. There are a few announcements before I call uh, Mr. Didat to present his rebuttal. Ladies and gentlemen, there will be a sequel to this debate or symposium at this venue tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. There was a newspaper report which expressed negative sentiments about Dr. Anis Sharosh having to come all the way from America to engage in the symposium or debate here. Apparently, there were some objections raised by certain theologians, local theologians. They felt that they are competently, they are sufficiently competent themselves to actually engage in a debate or symposium with uh, Mr. Ahmed Didat. As a result of which, the organizers have decided to actually accord these people an opportunity of presenting themselves here tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. and participating in a debate or symposium with him. But should no one uh, present uh, himself, then Mr. Ahmed Didat will present a lecture and will entertain questions from the floor, not the procedure which we applied today, 
questions having to be written and then read out to you, but rather you will be accorded the opportunity of actually directing questions at the speaker from a microphone which will be presented at the uh, foot of the stage. So do not forget, tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. there will be a sequel to this debate or symposium. I now call upon Mr. Didat to present a further rebuttal for 15 minutes. Mr. Chairman and brethren, the Quran and the Bible have been both begging Dr. Shorosh to find those three quarters, 75 percent of this book was copied from there. They'll remain begging. Dr. Shorosh began at the beginning of this rebuttal of his with a verse from the Bible, 2 Timothy 3.16. He quoted, he said, all scripture is given by inspiration and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, corrections, and instructions unto righteousness. It's a beautiful test, which from that he concludes that all scripture, meaning the Bible, is based on these four tests. If it is a word of God, it must prove one of these four points. It must either be your doctrine, your teaching, Anything, if it is from God, it must serve some purpose. It's not for your entertainment. It must be your doctrine. Reproof, you do certain things wrong, you'll be punished. Correction, not like this, but like that. And encouraging you to good deeds, instructions and to righteousness. Beautiful, beautiful. Actually, Paul was talking to Timothy about the previous verses. In verse 15, talking about the Old Testament. He was not talking about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Peter, and James, and Jude. But however, if the Christian wants to lump it all together, say lump it. Now, you see, I quoted one brief verse about Samson. Samson goes to Gaza, and he sees a harlot, and he goes into her. This is supposed to be in the word of God. Now, under the test that is given to us, by Dr. Sharosh, where does it fit in? Does it, is that your doctrine? That when you go to some place and you see a prostitute, you go in into her, your doctrine, is that your teaching? Reproof, was there any reproof given by God Almighty, say, I'll punish you, I'll put you in hell, nothing. Correction, he said, no, you mustn't do this, but you must marry her, and then you can go in. What? What instruction? Nothing at all. So I'm asking the doctor or any Christian at any time, please, please, read the Bible with this critical eye. There are things there in the Bible you can't fit in anywhere. Genesis chapter 38, you read about Judah, the father of the Jewish race. He has three sons and he gets the elder son married and he does something that God didn't like, so God killed him. Genesis chapter 38. Ask the Christian, where does it fit in? He says, reproof, which is correct. God told him not to do certain things and he did it, so God killed him. So now, Judah tells his second son, Onan, you go in unto your brother's wife, according to a Jewish custom, and beget a child by her, so that the name of the deceased might carry on. This guy, Onan, he goes unto his brother's wife, trying to fulfill his duty, but at the critical moment, the jealousy enters his heart. He says, look, the seed is mine, but the name will be my brother's. So he spills it on the ground. I'm reading the Bible. He spilled it on the ground. So God killed him also. Where does that fit in? Reproof. So look, this is your custom. You are supposed to do certain duty. You perform. You don't, God kills you also. Now the old man sends his daughter-in-law. The old man sends his daughter-in-law back to her father's house, telling her that the next time the third fellow is grown up, I will call you. But conveniently he forgets. Conveniently. So the woman wants to take revenge. 
So she gets the news that her father-in-law is going to Timnat. I'm reading the book of Genesis, chapter 38. He's going to Timnat to share his sheep. So she goes and sits by the, way, by the wayside and covers her face. The old man passing by, he sees this woman and he's game. He's game. So he comes to her, I'm reading the Holy Bible. He says, allow me to come in unto thee. What Samson did to, in Gaza, same thing, let me do to you. So she says, I'm reading the Holy Bible. What will thou give me? So he said, I'll give you a kid from the flock. Look, there are Christians here. You have your Bibles with you. If I'm misquoting anything, please take me up at question time. He said, I'll give you a kid, a goat kid from the flock. So she says, what guarantee that I will give it? He said, what guarantee do you want? He said, your signet, your ring, and your bracelet, and your staff. So the old man gave it to her, and he cohibited with his daughter-in-law by the roadside, and made her pregnant. Twins, twins, straight away, one hit, twins. And these twins are Fares and Zara, who are the great-grandfathers of Jesus Christ, according to the genealogy. Children of incest are the great-grandfathers of Jesus. Now I'm asking, in this test that you gave, beautiful test, 2 Timothy 3.16, doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction unto righteousness. I'm asking, where does this fit in? Into the book of God. Tell me. And if you can't fit in anywhere, then it fits into pornography. Pornography. You see, he had a small joke against the Muslims about polygamy. You see, since Islam allows, Islam allows you to marry four. He didn't quote the verse correctly. He was saying Surah Nisa, verse 3, or something to the effect. The Quran says, marry women of your choice by twos and threes and fours. But if you cannot do justice between them, marry only one. The only religious book, I'm saying the only religious book on the face of the earth, which has this expression, marry only one, is the Quran. There is no other book on earth. And this is the solution to your problem. He has settled down in America. He has married a beautiful young lady, an American woman. Congratulations. But now, Wait, wait, wait. The, the American statistics, they tell us, there are 7.8 million more women than men in America. That's almost 8 million more women in your country, sir, the land of your domicile. 8 million women who can't get husbands. If every woman, if every man in America got married, there'll still be 8 million women who can't get husbands. I'm asking, in this book of God that you are boasting about, what is the solution to your problem? Jimmy Swaggart. If you get the tape, the tape is available. Jimmy Swaggart. Anil Sharosh, the tape is available. You can get it before you go. They are eight pounds each. Jimmy Swaggart, if you see this debate, at the outset, he is also having a laugh at our expense. He says, you know, Mr. Didat, he says, you know, we had a chat in the waiting room, and Mr. Didat says that the Muslim can have four wives. Islam allows four wives. He just corrected me, said up to four. I said, well, <clears throat> Mr. Didat, Christianity only allows us one, so I had to get the best on the first shot. So he said, but you see, Christianity allows us only one. And I have to choose the best. <laughs> Get the tape. Get the tape. He said, I have to choose the best. And you know, the best was not good enough. <laughs> Look, 
look, this, all these tele-evangelists, all, one by one, they're all falling. Reverend Mark, Mark, Marvin Gorman, an evangelist, you know, tele-evangelist, he appears on television, tantalizing millions. He was caught with a prostitute. Jim Becker, Jim Becker, with Jessica Hans, another prostitute. Jimmy Swaggart, average of two trips a month to the prostitute for his satisfaction. I said, you laugh at us? You are a fool. I said, the laugh is on you. You Americans, you have a problem. You Britisher, you have a problem. You French, you have a problem. You Germans, you have a problem. And to these, there are no solutions in your book. No solution. Islam gives an answer to your problem. Divorce. 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 Brother, shall we just talk about divorce? You know how the Muslims. Look, when you mall practice, when you do something against your own teaching, you are culpable. No doubt the general Muslim community seems to have got that idea that when you want to divorce your wife, you just have to say talaq, talaq, talaq. But he's supposed to have known the Quran. There is a chapter in the Quran, the whole chapter is called Surah Talaq, meaning chapter divorce. You must have read it. Surah Talaq. Talaq means divorce. At the outset, Brother Sharosh, he said, he has been studying the Quran for two years now. Two years. Uh, sure. See what the Quran says, please, brother. And then point a finger at the Quran and say, look, this Quranic teaching is not right, it's not feasible, it's unreasonable. Talk about the Quran. Don't talk about the Muslims. As much as we have bad Muslims, you have bad Christians. You, uh, He also quoted a Quranic verse, like Rafiddin, which means there is no compulsion in religion. Compulsion is worthless. At the point of the gun or the knife, you force somebody to say, read the Shahada, the Kalima, the creed of Islam, and the man is forced to read. What is it worth? Nothing. There is no compulsion in religion. But the insinuation is that the Muslims were doing compulsion. I said, look, my brother, Sharosh, you are a proof that the Muslims didn't use any compulsion for 1,400 years. For 1,400 years, you and your other Christians, whom you now say number 14 million, they lived in our midst. In, in Egypt, the Muslims have been the overlord of that country for 1,400 years. For a few years, the French came. For a few years, the British came. But overall, for 1,400 years, the Muslim has been ruling that land. And yet, and yet, today, you can boast there are 10 million Coptic Christians in Egypt. If there was compulsion of any kind, there would not have been a single Christian left in that country. The Muslims ruled Spain for 800 years. 800 years. We, because we failed to deliver the message, we were kicked out. We were kicked out. Shame on us. We didn't fulfill our obligations. But if they had used any type of force, even economic force, for 800 years, there would not have been a single Christian left in the country. We Muslims, we rule India for a thousand years. But after a thousand years of Muslim rule, eventually when partition takes place, the Muslim gets one quarter, the Hindu gets three quarter. Why? Because we didn't do the job. We didn't use any compulsion. And which Muslim army went to Indonesia? 
Which Muslim army went to Nigeria? Which Muslim army conquered the east coast of Africa? Which Muslim army? Today, the British, Mus the Britisher and the American, he's coming towards Islam. I want to know what sword, what sword? What sword is the Muslim using? The sword of the intellect. George Bernard Shaw, he said, if any religion has a chance of conquering England, nay Europe, within the next hundred years, so that religion is Islam. Look, 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 Bernard Shaw, Bernard Shaw had the foresight, he could see. But we Muslims, we have failed Islam. Wallah, we have failed. We have failed. We haven't made a start yet. We believe. We say we believe, but we have not made a start yet. This is our problem. The, the destiny is ours. Wallah, it is ours. Allah says, Liyuzihira hu alad kulli. He has given you a deen, a way of life that is the master, super, overcome and supersede them all, bulldoze them all. Whether it be Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianism, Communism, Judaism, every ism. Sword. Sword. I'm asking, what sword? Thomas Carlyle. Thomas, Thomas Carlyle, Thomas Carlyle in 1840, he delivered a series of lectures here in the UK. In England, Thomas Carlyle, one of the greatest things of the past century. Thomas Carlyle. And he says, the sword, the sword. He said, the sword indeed. But where will you get your sword? He said, every new opinion at its beginning is precisely in the minority of one. In one man's head alone, there it dwells as yet. That he take a sword and try to propagate with that will do little for him. He said, first, you must get your sword. And how do you get your sword? Through the intellect, through reasoning. Allah says, invite all to the ways of thy Lord with wisdom. The sword of the intellect of wisdom. And with beautiful preaching. And reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. This is the sword. This is the last point that I can handle in the time given to me. Dr. Shoroz said, Muhammad was not an ummi. He was a literate man. And he lied again about the history of Islam that at Hudaybiyah, Muhammad changed the words to Muhammad ibn Abdullah instead of Muhammad Rasulullah. What the Holy Prophet Muhammad did was, he is instructing the scribes when the Quraysh, the pagans, the mushriks, when they objected to Muhammad Rasulullah, Muhammad sallallahu he told the scribe, cut off Muhammad Rasulullah. So the disciple in love and feeling, they said, no, we can't cut it off with our own hands. We can't cut it off. We can't say that Muhammad is not Rasulullah. So now what to do? The treaty was being jeopardized. So the Holy Prophet is asking, where are these words, Muhammad Rasulullah? So he saw the word Rasulullah and he took the pen and he marked it off. That is what he did. He didn't put Muhammad ibn Abdullah. You see, what we need for things like this, discussions like this, we need more time. We need point by point discussion. In 75 minutes, you throw 150 red herrings and say, come on, catch, 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 catch. It is <laughs> not done. <laughs> I'm going to select papers from this basket which have questions on them and I'm going to read out some of the questions. It's going to be impossible to go through all the questions.
So the stewards who are collecting questions, I don't think we'd be able to go through those questions which you are collecting, so it's really pointless. First question to Dr. Sharosh. Jesus forgave the women caught in the act of adultery. Reference John 4-18 saying, go and sin no more. If Jesus was part of the triune Godhood, when Adam and Eve disobeyed him and the Holy Ghost, then why did Jesus not intervene, being the embodiment of love and forgive Adam, Eve and the serpent, saying, go and sin no more? To answer your question, I would simply say this. The background of the story is, number one, the Jews had developed, unfortunately, two laws, one for the women and one for the men. It was to be both stoned. Jesus lovingly asked if any man had not sinned to throw the first stone at her, which meant that they were guilty too. And when they left the stones and left her, he forgave her sin. Because God is not a God of a double standard, one for women and one for men, but one and the same. Number two, as for his ability from the beginning, God had planned to, re to redeem man. And in chapter 3 of Genesis, verse 15, we are told God made a promise then to Adam and Eve that he will sin from the seed of the woman. And remember what Mr. Didad just said. Miraculously, not the seed of man, notice, but the seed of the woman, one who will crush the serpent's head. And it was Christ Jesus of Nazareth fulfilling this promise who did that on the cross by dying for sinners, all sinners, not just Adam and Eve. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you are of the opinion that the speaker has not answered the question, and if you're correct in your belief, then that would obviously amount to a default on the part of the speaker. So I would suggest that you refrain from uh, disturbance and expressing opinions from the floor. First question, addressed to Mr. Ahmad Didaf. Do Muslims believe in the virgin birth of our Lord Jesus, or do they believe his father was Joseph? Mr. Ahmad Didaf. I'll read out the question again. Do Muslims believe in the virgin birth of our Lord Jesus, or do they believe his father was Joseph? The question, whether we Muslims believe, the question is, is our Lord, no, we don't believe that the Lord, in, in the virgin birth of our Lord Jesus, we don't believe in the Lord Jesus, we believe in Jesus, Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, Jesus Christ, that he was born miraculously, without any male intervention. So, in the genealogy as given by Luke, he is the son of Joseph. And the words as was supposed are written in brackets, which means the Holy Ghost didn't inspire Luke to say as was supposed. These are the creations of them. In other words, this, there is still sense there that Joseph the carpenter was the actual father of Jesus. We do not believe that. We believe that he was born miraculously. And the Holy Quran testifies to that fact. In Surah Ali Ibrahim, when the good news is given to us, she says, She says, Oh my Lord, how shall I have a son when no man has touched me? So the angel says in reply, said, Even so, Allah creates what He wills. Whenever He decrees a matter, Allah Baritala, whenever He decrees a matter, He merely says to it, Be and it is. So we believe in the miraculous birth of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, that without any male intervention, he was born, and Joseph the carpenter does not have any place in the house of Islam. There's no place for Joseph the carpenter anywhere. The next question, ladies and gentlemen, is addressed to Dr. Anis Sharosh. It reads, a Dublin housewife, it's obviously from a Dublin housewife. Mrs. Anne Spicer had asked the Irish censors 
to ban the Bible because she claims one, it glorifies sex, two, it accepts the sexual abuse of young girls, and three, it supports mutilation. As an expert on the Bible, what have you to say about her accusations? Dr. Anisha Roche. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to uh, respond to that by reminding not just whoever asked this question, but Mr. Dera as well. You see, the Bible is not a biography of your life, grossing over your bad things and showing how nice and great you are. The Bible is truth, and it shows you the wrong and the right, so you will learn not to do the wrong. That's the part of it. As for this, as for this, the Quran, the Quran also glorifies sex in as much as it tells you you have 72 ladies waiting for you when you get there. As far as the record of the Bible, it tells you, it tells you the truth. And when you read the Bible within the context, God never condoned any of these events. They are recorded to show you how evil people were and eventually how God judged them. It never approves of wrong because right and wrong don't go together. Darkness and light don't go together. And therefore, the Bible tells you that to remind you to escape these as he tells you in Romans chapter 1, how God eventually gave them up because of their immorality and sensuality. Thank you. The next question addressed to Mr. Didat, and it reads, through your knowledge of the Muslim faith, can you vouch for the fact that Muhammad was not anti-Christ? Uh, in short, the question is whether Muhammad was not the anti-Christ. Antichrist means one who is opposed to Isa a.s., one who is Dajjal. Dajjal is the term we use for Antichrist. How can it be? Look, Islam, Muhammad sallam, made it possible for us Muslims to believe in Jesus. No Muslim is a Muslim if he does not believe in Jesus. We Muslims are made to believe on the authority of this holy book, the Quran, that Jesus Christ was one of the mightiest messengers of God. We are made to believe that he was born miraculously. We are made to believe that he was the Christ, the Messiah, the Messiah. We are made to believe that he gave life to the dead by God's permission and he healed those born blind and the lepers by God's permission. And the Christian Bible testifies to this that our Nabi Kareem sallam, is a true messenger of God the test it gives in the first epistle of John chapter 4 verse it says it says beloved believe not every spirit but try the spirits whether they are of God for many false prophets have gone out into the world it continues the spirit that confesseth that Jesus is the Christ is of God a true spirit is a true prophet and a false spirit is a false prophet. The prophet that says that Jesus is the Christ, is of God, says his holy book. This is the test. Now, why don't you apply it? The holy prophet Muhammad is made to say, Behold, the angel said, O Mary, 
The book also says, said by the fruits you shall know them. Do men gather figs from the thistle or grapes from the thorn? He said, every good tree will be good fruit and every evil tree will be evil fruit. By the fruits you shall know them. And you count them on a man-to-man -man basis, the Muslim and the Christian, the Muslim and the Hindu, the Muslim and anybody else, in brotherhood, in piety, in charity, in sobriety. There is not another community that can show a candle to us that we are better than you. We have our shortcomings. We have our black sheep. We have, like any other community, we have the good and the bad. We have our drunkards that might put many a Christian under the table. We have. But as a people, as a whole, the biggest society of teetotals in the world are the Muslims. Bigger society of teetotalists, people who don't imbibe alcohol are the Muslims. We have in my country, I'm boasting and nobody has contradicted me yet, that the Muslims of South Africa, we have the lowest alcoholic consumption. We have the lowest gambling rate. We have the lowest suicide rate. We have the lowest prison rate. We have the lowest divorce rate. And we have the highest charity rate in the country. Jesus said, by the fruits you shall know them. He says, judge them by the fruits, not by individuals. This ruler had done certain thing wrong and that guy had done certain thing wrong. I said, why don't you look at your own man? You know, Hitler, who was he? Christian. Mussolini, who was he? Christian. Talk about them. Said, look. I've just been advised that we have sufficient time only for six more questions, that is three questions each. To Reverend Sharosh, this question reads, in Matthew 27, we read about the wandering corpses after Jesus was put on the cross. Why do all the other books of the New Testament not mention this great event of mass resurrection? Is not resurrection a fundamental belief in Christianity? Shall I repeat the question? The question, in Matthew 27, we read about the wandering corpses after Jesus was put on the cross. I wonder what happened to Uzair and his donkey after he was raised a hundred years after they were dead. Why do all the other books of the New Testament mention this great event? I guess what he means, why not? Why do all the other books of the New Testament not mention this great event of mass resurrection? I do not feel embarrassed to say to you, I do not know why, but I know this much, it was. I do not think it deserves clapping because none of you is so intelligent to know all the answers, because you would be God. Now, now, I'm not finished, I'm not finished. Number two, number two. This was a token from God Almighty about the coming resurrection which will take place at the end of time. So God was giving us a foretaste, if you please, of what is about to take place. He says, is not the resurrection a fundamental belief in Christianity? Yes, it is. And that's why Jesus was the firstborn of the dead. And that's why he tells us that we one day, when the trumpet will sound, which is also borrowed by Muhammad, borrowed by Muhammad from the Bible, when the trumpet sounds, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we who are alive shall be taken in the clouds. God's word is to be believed. Whether you understand it or not is a difficulty that you may face, 
Take for instance the Quran. I would like to ask how many of you Arabic speaking people understand the Quran in Arabic? Oh yeah? No kidding. You're not telling the truth because scholars, oh no. no. Listen to this. The commentator, the newest, listen, the most modern, the most modern book about the Islamic verses, which is a thick book, this thick, by Dr. Cassis, says that the Quran is untranslatable, untranslatable from Arabic to any other language. And therefore, it is not understood. That's a truth. Thank you. The next question to Mr. Dida. Don't you think that it is proof enough that Jesus is God because he brought Lazarus back from the dead? Uh, the question was, I think something like this, that Jesus is God because he rose Lazarus back from the dead. No way does the Bible say that Jesus gave back life back to Lazarus. No way. Jesus Christ, when his friend Lazarus had died, if you read the Gospel of St. John, that he was not there. When he goes to the village where his friend Lazarus was supposed to be, and the sister of Lazarus, Martha, tells him, he says, look, if you were here with us, my brother might not have died. Meaning by some miraculous performance, you might have saved my brother's life. So Jesus tells her, he said, even now, if you have faith, you shall see the glory of God. Even now, not my glory, the glory of God. So saying, he says, lead me to where you have laid him. So they take him to the sepulcher. Sepulcher is a grave carved out of a rock. And while he's going, he's crying to God for help. The Bible says he moaned in the spirit. He groaned in the spirit, meaning he's crying, talking to God, which is not audible to the people that are with him, as if he's crying, moaning, mm, 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 something to their effect. And he was actually communing with God. And when he got the assurance from God, Jesus Christ looks up towards heaven and he says, Oh my Father, God Almighty, I know that thou hast heard me. What? That groaning, that crying that beseeching Allah for help. I know that thou hast heard me and I know that thou hearest me always. But because of the people that stood by, these superstitious, credulous people, they will think that I have done the job. I have given life back to the dead. Because of the people that stood by, I said it, meaning I'm talking aloud, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. That's all. That you have sent me, it is you who are doing the works. And he says, I can of my own self do nothing. I, by the finger of God, cast out devils. I, by the Spirit of God, do these things. Where does he say, Jesus, that I gave life to the dead? No way. The next question to Dr. Sharosh. Doesn't appear to be very legible. I'll do my best. Which version of the Bible do you accept as authentic? Do you agree with the versions which were removed? 1 John 5, 7, which read, There are three who bear witness in... I don't know what that word reads. It's Lenin, I think. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and that these three are one. Uh, Dr. Shirosh, have you understood that question? This question, ladies and gentlemen, deals with a text that is supposed to be in the text of the scripture called in the proper language of biblical textual criticism, interpolation. That means it is not in the original text. 
When we talk about the Bible, ladies and gentlemen, I think I need to remind you. You believe the Quran came in Arabic. The Old Testament came in Hebrew. The New Testament in Greek. In order to understand precisely the meaning of the scripture, you need to go to the original language. In criticizing that scripture, shall we say, approaching it in analytical manner, we are not afraid when a passage had been interpolating the scripture to identify it. Whereas you are, you have never been willing until this day in a public manner to approach the book in an in analytical manner. And you have not been very carefully listening to what's being said. Instead, you've been jumping up and sounding off. Secondly, as for that verse itself, that verse itself, in the new textual translations, depending on the copies that we have from ancient Greek, such as the copy of Sanaticus, such as the copies in Greek at the museum here in London, we have discovered the more ancient discoveries archaeologists make, the more carefully we are able to analyze and show you the precise writing from as far back as we can find. The question I have for you is this, why did Uthman burn all your Qur'ans? Do you realize? I have here in my hand materials for the history of the text of the Quran in which we have identified mushafs in Al-Azhar and in Damascus that go back to the days of Muhammad himself where the variant readings are identified. And I challenge you to get the book by Arthur Jeffrey, who is a scholar that spent about 40 years studying that. So the answer to the question is that verse is not in the scripture. And this is what we believe because we believe in the authenticity of the scripture itself, according to textual, analytical, archaeological criticism that we appreciate to believe the truth is the truth. Next question to Mr. Didat. Don't Muslims also have different versions of the Quran for Arabs and for non-Arabs? The question was, do Muslims also have different versions of the Quran? We have no different versions. We have, we have different translations. What is the difference between a version and a translation? I tell you. See, translation, you have a choice of words. Like the, the verse I quoted you from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 18, verse 9, where it says, I have lost none. That's one, one translation. Another one says, not one or none, choice of words. Not a single one. These are what is called choice in, in translating words. It's not version. But the version is, as the brother was trying to explain, he said that the verse on the Trinity is an interpolation. He said that. Interpolation in something that has been pushed into it, which is not supposed to be there. And in the Bible he presented to me, that verse is a part of the text. In other words, now that's a version. You open another book, the Roman Catholic version of the Bible, which is the RSV version, Roman Catholic, they threw it out as a fabrication, that verse. It's a different version. This RSV is a different version. You remember the verse I quoted you? Jesus telling Paul, why kickest thyself against the pricks? That verse, that filthy, dirty verse is now thrown out of this as an interpolation, as a fabrication, as an adulteration. So it's a different version. Now you know what's a version. You see the version now, that one, this one has it. This one is thrown out, version. This one here has 66 books inside.
This one here has got 73 books inside. It's a different version. I hope you understand now. It's my simple English. So we have no different versions of the Quran. The Arabic Quran universally is the same. No difference between one part of the world and another. In translations, we have Pekthal, Muhammad Ali, Yusuf Ali, Daryabadi, Asad. You can have a hundred of them. There are different translations, but they are not different versions. Only choice of words in which they differ. Just two more questions, and I urge the speakers to address these questions as shortly as possible. I'm told that we have to round up now uh, to Dr. Anis Sharosh. Why are the Apocrypha, which were accepted up to the time of Martin Luther as God's word, rejected by a portion of the Christian world? And why do Roman Catholics still accept them as God's word? What, in your opinion, disqualifies them from being the word of God? Whoever asked that, asked that question apparently does not know what he says. Because in the, in the book, listen, please behave yourself. Now, all right. Don't act like children, please. All right. Now, the question. If you read this copy of the Bible, you will notice that it introduces you to the words that indicate these are suggested as helpful reading material. It never says they are inspired like the rest of the 66 books. And apparently, you think that they are. In my hand, I have the Quran by Pixar. And I read here, فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لِذَنْبِكَ وَلِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ وَاللَّهُ يَعْلَمُ مُتَقَلِّبُكُمْ وَمَثْوَاكُمْ Now in English, here is the translation. So know, O Muhammad, that there is no God save Allah, and ask for forgiveness for thy sin, and for believing men and believing women. Allah knoweth both your place of turmoil and your, and then he forgets the rest of the verse. It's right here. They forgot to translate the whole thing. What do you think of that? What do you think of that? Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, your attention, please. Your attention, please. We have about a minute to go, and I want to put the last question to Mr. Didat. Mr. Didat, will you please answer this question as quickly as possible? Original sin is a reality. Why do Muslims reject this most important belief? Repeat the question, original sin is a reality. Why do Muslims reject this most important belief? The question is asked about the original sin, that it is a reality. What do you mean the original sin? You see, the Christians, they believe that what Adam and Eve, when they at the forbidden fruit because of that sin entered into the world and every human child from the time of Adam up to doomsday is a sinner and as such is destined to hell every human being goes to hell because of the sin of Adam and Eve what they did they ate the forbidden fruit so God Almighty is going to put everybody into hell unless you believe as Dr. Shorosh would say, you believe that Christ paid for that sin, you are absorbed. Otherwise, each and every one, whether you call yourself Hindu, Muslim, Jew, whatever you are, everybody goes to hell for the sin of Adam and Eve. I said, look, that is not a, a just law. Because the Bible, your Bible says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The one that sins, that one will be punished, that one will be destroyed. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. If father Adam sinned, his children will not be made responsible for his sins. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. Any good deed that the good man does, he gets his reward. And the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Whatever evil thing the evil man does, he will be punished. 
But if the wicked will turn, will repent, do istighfar from all the sin that he has committed and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. In other words, every person is personally responsible for his, his or her action. There is no such thing as man inherit sin. Which is, in the words of one of our great Britisher, Major Yeats Brown, he wrote a book on the life of a Bengal Lancer, in which he says, referring to the Christian doctrine of the original sin and the redemption by the blood of Christ, Major Yeats Brown, he says, no heathen tribe has ever conceived so grotesque an idea, filthy, dirty, ugly idea. No heathen tribe has ever thought out such, such silly things. He says, no heathen tribe has ever conceived so grotesque an idea, involving as it does the assumption that man was born with a hereditary stain upon him and that this stain for which he was not personally responsible was to be atoned for. And the creator of all things had to sacrifice his only begotten son to neutralize this mysterious curse. Is it hasn't occurred to any backward barbaric people, no heathen tribe has ever thought of such, such things, such nonsense. There is no such thing as the original sin. Ladies and gentlemen, Ladies and gentlemen, you're once again reminded about the lecture or debate which will be held at this venue tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. You're requested to attend and to support. Gratitude must be expressed to the organizers, Mr. Ahmad Dida, Mr. Abdullah Dida, Mr. Yusuf Dida, and especially Mr. Shamshad Khan of the Islamic Propagation Center, which is situated at 481 Coventry Road, Small Heath, Bir Birmingham, and his team who labored so relentlessly. Our appreciation to the speakers, Mr. Ahmed Dida and Dr. Anis Sharosh for their presentations, but perhaps the most important, thank you for attending. Assalamu alaikum, peace be with you. If the Quran is indeed from God, does it contradict itself in as much as it says, okay. mm -hmm. Therefore, Jesus was born, he died, and he rose again. The second question. If God... Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Let me challenge you. 75% of the wonderful Quran in my wonderful language of Arabic is from the Bible. And I would urge you to look into the Bible and find out where these sources are. And the and I'd like to urge you to consider that when we say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim we see the Trinity 113 times in the Quran, like the Bible says, Bismil Ab Wal Ibn wa Ruh al We must love one another. We must recognize the truth. Even the Quran testifies that Jesus is the only person who knows the hour of judgment. Matthew's Gospel, we are told that the wise men. I also like to say that it will help to ask Mr. Dida to see if he can explain to you where did you come up with the word Isa in the Quran when his name is Yasua in Arabic. I'd like to know about that. Furthermore, a small group of scholars in Jerusalem labored to achieve the fulfillment of a 16-year-old project. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِنْ كُنْتُمْ تُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ حَقًّا فَآمِنُوا بِي وَلَا تَخَافُوا إِنَّ لَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ جَنَّاتٍ نُزُلًا فَلَأَسْبِقَنَّكُمْ إِلَى اللَّهِ لِأُعِدَّهَ لَكُمْ ثُمَّ لَآتِيَنَّكُمْ نَزْلَةً أُخْرَى 
وإنكم لتعرفون السبيل إلى قبلة العليا فقال له توم الحواري مولانا إنا لنملك من ذلك علما فقال له عيسى أنا هو الصراط إلى الله حقا ومن دوني لا تستطيعون إليه سبيلا ومن عرفني فكأنما عرف الله وهئنكم منذ الآن تعرفونه وتبصيرنه يقينا فقال له فيليب الحواري مولانا أرنا الله جهرة تكفينا فقال عيسى أولم تؤمنوا بعد وقد أقمت معكم دهرا فمن رآني فكما فكأنما رأى الله جهرا For you who do not know Arabic This is We are told in Surah An-Nisa verse 3 وإن This is I hope will not be misunderstood but this is a verse in which it says, and if you can be fair to marry, marry as many as four, but if you cannot marry just one, one is bound to ask if Muhammad... He didn't quote the verse correctly. He was saying Surah Nisa verse 3 or something to the effect. The Quran says, marry women of your choice by twos and threes and fours, but if you cannot do justice between them, marry only one. The only religious book, I'm saying the only religious book on the face of the earth, which has this expression, marry only one, is the Quran. There is no other book on earth. A Muslim husband may cast his wife adrift without... A Muslim husband may cast his wife adrift without giving a single reason or even a notice. The husband possesses absolute, immediate, and unquestioned power of divorce. He can simply announce to his wife, I divorced you three times, and she's gone. No privilege of a correspondent. But he's supposed to have known the Quran. There is a chapter in the Quran, the whole chapter is called Surah Talaq, meaning chapter divorce. You must have read it. Surah Talaq. Talaq means divorce. At the outset, Brother Sharosh, he said he has been studying the Quran for two years now. Two years. Uh, sure. See what the Quran says, please, brother. And then point a finger at the Quran and say, look. In Surah Al Baqarah, verse 256, we are told. There is no compulsion in religion. La ikraha fiddin. It was very different after Muhammad's power was established when the Muslim armies went forth to attack the surrounding tribes and nations. They offered them three options. Islam, tribute, or the sword. Incidentally, I said, look, my brother, Sharosh, you are a proof that the Muslims didn't use any compulsion for 1,400 years. For 1,400 years, you and your other Christians, whom you now say number 14 million, they lived in our midst. In, in Egypt, the Muslims have been the overlord of that country for 1,400 years. For a few years, the French came. For a few years, the British came. But overall, for 1,400 years, the Muslim has been ruling that land. And yet, and yet, today, you can boast there are 10 million Coptic Christians in Egypt. If there was compulsion of any kind, there would not have been a single Christian left in that country. We are told 
that when the treaty with the Meccans was to be signed by Muhammad, they refused to acknowledge him as the Apostle of Allah. Relenting to their demands, he struck out that title and wrote with his hand, instead of Muhammad, Rasulullah, Muhammad, son of Abdullah. A second incident. And he lied again about the history of Islam that at Hudaybiyah, Muhammad changed the words to Muhammad ibn Abdullah instead of Muhammad Rasulullah. What the Holy Prophet Muhammad did was, he is instructing the scribes when the Quraysh, the pagans, the mushriks, when they objected to Muhammadur Rasulullah, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he told the scribe, cut off Muhammad Rasulullah. So the disciple in love and feeling, they said, no, we can't cut it off with our own hands. We can't cut it off. We can't say that Muhammad is not Rasulullah. So now what to do? The treaty was being jeopardized. So the Holy Prophet is asking, where are these words, Muhammadur Rasulullah? So he saw the word Rasulullah and he took the pen and he marked it off. That is what he did. He didn't put Muhammad ibn Abdullah. In Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 106, مَا نَنْسَكْ مِنْ آيَةٍ أَوْ نَفْسِهَا أَوْ نُنْسِهَا That's right. And there is no changing or altering to the declaration or decisions of Allah. Muslims claim that the Quran, Surah Maryam 19:28, says, "Ya ukhta Haruna, ma kana abuki imran sawiyan, wa ma kana ummaki baghiya." I said, you see, the answer to your problem is in your own book. <laughs> the Bible is in your holy Bible. Where is it? It is in the first book of the New Testament. First book, chapter 1, verse 1. You will never forget. One, one, one. Three aces in a game. You will never forget. What does it say? You ask me, what does it say? I tell you what it says. It says, you remember, I showed you the genealogy? Yes. The first verse, it says, this is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of Abraham, the son of David. Ask him, ask him. Is that what it says? Jesus is the son of Abraham, he is the son of David. Then in the Gospel of St. Luke, in the other genealogy, he is the son of Joseph. Joseph the carpenter is his father. Then in the book of Mark, he is the son of God. Wait, 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 wait. He is the son of Abraham, means Abraham is his father. He is the son of David, David is his father. He is the son of Joseph, Joseph is his father. He is the son of God, God is his father. A man who's got four fathers. In your language, sir, in America, what do you call it? <laughs> he can respond. He said, no, 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 it doesn't mean that. So what does it mean? So he starts explaining. I said, you see, it's the same. You are, you know, look, Jesus told you, he warned you. He said, judge not that he be not judged. For with what judgment he judge, he shall be judged. He said, you hypocrite, why seest thou the mote in thy brother's eyes and seest not the beam in thy own eye? So first remove the beam from your own eye.
2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Romans 15. You see, I quoted one brief verse about Samson. Samson goes to Gaza and he sees a harlot and he goes into her. This is supposed to be in the word of God. Now, under the test that is given to us by Dr. Sharosh, where does it fit in? Does it, is that your doctrine? That when you go to some place and you see a prostitute, you go in into her, your doctrine is that your teaching? Reproof. Was there any reproof given by God Almighty? Say, I'll punish you. I'll put you in hell. Nothing. Correction. He said, no, you mustn't do this. But you must marry her. And then you can go in. What? What instruction? Nothing at all. So I'm asking the doctor or any Christian at any time, please, please, read the Bible with this critical eye. There are things there in the Bible you can't fit in anywhere. Genesis chapter 38. The next question to Dr. Sharosh doesn't appear to be very legible, I'll do my best. Which version of the Bible do you accept as authentic? Do you agree with the versions which were removed? 1 John 5, 7, which read, There are three who bear witness in... I don't know what that word reads, it's Lenin, I think. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and that these three are one. Uh, Dr. Shirosh, have you understood that question? This question, ladies and gentlemen, deals with a text that is supposed to be in the text of the scripture called in the proper language of biblical textual criticism, interpolation. That means it is not in the original text. When we talk about the Bible, ladies and gentlemen, I think... I need but the version is, as the brother was trying to explain, he said that the verse on the Trinity is an interpolation. He said that. Interpolation means something that has been pushed into it which is not supposed to be there. And in the Bible he presented to me, that verse is a part of the text. In other words, now that's a version. You open another book, the Roman Catholic version of the Bible, which is the RSV version, Roman Catholic, they threw it out as a fabrication, that verse. It's a different version. In my hand, I have the Quran by Pixar, and I read here, فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ واستغفر لذنبك وللمؤمنين والمؤمنات والله يعلم متقلبكم ومثواكم Now in English, here is the translation. So know, O Muhammad, that there is no God save Allah and ask for forgiveness for thy sin and for believing men and believing women. Allah knoweth both your place of turmoil and your 
and then he forgets the rest of the verse. It's right here. They forgot to translate the whole thing. What do you think of that? What do you think of that? Thank you. Allah.